difficult person from my perspective and from the perspective of the Vistage members that I deal with all the time is someone who basically is resisting what they're saying. They may be argumentative, they may be stubborn, they may not be listening, they may be a know-it-all. They, you know, There's a lot of adjectives. As a matter of fact, when I'm doing my dealing with, with difficult people component of that, I ask the members to come up with the adjectives they would use to describe the difficult people in their life. And they love that. So yeah, it, it, it's actually in the eye of the beholder because some people will see argumentative people as difficult. Other people see people that shut down and don't give you anything as difficult. So it's just the person that you're trying to connect with, you're trying to communicate with, but they're either not getting it or they're pushing back or they're are outright uh, defensive or resistant to what you're saying. So basically when I'm talking to people, I say, okay, why don't everybody make a fist as tight as you can? And people do this. And I say, okay, if someone were to come along and try to force your fist open, what would be your initial response? And everybody goes tighter. So what that means in terms of the lesson of the fist is whenever we try to force someone to change or make them change, they will actually resist us or resent us even more and actually start arguing for the opposite of what we're wanting, start defending the very behavior we want them to change. First thing, and I've got a six-step model that is designed to show them how to be effective with difficult people. Step number one is we've got to be clear about the qualities and characteristics we're bringing to the conversation. Every CEO wants their people to be accountable. And they're upset sometimes because their people aren't accountable. And that's, I get it. So I say to the CEOs, if we want people to be accountable, guess what we've got to be? Uh, accountable. Which means we've got to make sure we are taking 100% responsibility for the qualities and characteristics we are bringing to the conversation. Because if we're coming from that lower brain and we're frustrated or we're stressed or we're kind of, uh, you know, kind of making them do something or they sense that we don't respect them or they don't, we don't like them or we don't get them, then they're not going to hear anything we have to say is valuable. I talk about dealing with a person in a way that engenders trust versus obedience. I talk about obedience is what you teach your dog. Trust is what you're wanting from your people. So the first thing we've got to know is what do I want to bring to the conversation? I've got to know who I am when I'm coming from this upper 80% of the brain, the qualities that I bring. Second step in the model is, okay, not what do I want to change, but what do I want to bring out? If our job as a CEO is to bring out the best in everybody around us, we've got to have some idea what that best looks like. But when someone's being difficult, all our middle brain limbic system sees as their difficult behavior. We don't see their best. And so we're always trying to get them to change that negative behavior. They hear that as criticism. That's where the lesson of the fist happens. So the first thing is we've got to be clear about what we want to bring. We've got to be clear about what we want to bring out. The third step is we've got to be clear about what's important to them. Because that is actually the key to their cooperation. Do they want to be respected by us? Do they want to be valued by us? Do they want to be promoted by us? We've got, to, we've got to be able to deal with them in a way where they get that we know what's important to them and we're blending our solution with that. Stephen Covey talks, talks about the third alternative, which is blending what's important to them with what's important to us. And actually, act, acting, uh, act, actualizing what's important to them or getting to what's important to them actually comes from a very specific part of the brain. So we've got to know who they are when they're coming from this upper 80% of the brain and what's important to them. That's the third step. The fourth step is they've got to know we get it. So this is where listening and empathizing come in. Now everybody talks about listening and empathizing, but this is about kind of becoming kind of an Aikido master, kind of a ninja warrior here, where when someone throws a punch, you actually step into the model and kind of take that energy and direct the conversation. So it has you going, boy, I see this is important to you, and I can totally understand how you would see it that way. Which doesn't necessarily mean I would see it that way. People think empathizing means agreement. It doesn't. Empathizing is freeing people from the need to convince us that they have a right to think and feel what they think and feel. So we've got to be clear about what we want to bring. We've got to be clear about what we want to bring out. We've got to be clear about what's important to them, and they've got to be clear that we get it. Then we go to the fifth step in the model, and this is where we get them to shift from their resistant brain to their receptive brain. And the way we do that is we ask them a top-of-the-mind question. Questions are the search engine for the brain. So anytime we want someone to shift from the lower brain to the upper brain, we've got to ask them a question about the solution and the future, not about the problem and the past. So one of my favorite top-of-the-mind questions I, I teach is when someone's made a mistake, 
rather than trying to make them feel bad about the mistake, I like the question, okay, knowing what you know now, how would you do that differently in the future? See, there's no shame in the future. There's no blame in the future. It allows people to take what they've learned from the mistake, apply it to future behavior, and go forward. So what I do is I help people kind of take what's important to someone and what's important to us and craft a top of the mind question on step five and then you go to step six which is problem solving. Which means you don't go to problem solving until they have shifted from the, uh, uh, from the problem brain to the solution brain.